Oh, hey, welcome to Wednesday, March 24th. And this is our statistics class. And we have a really nice set of examples for you today. I'll get as many examples in as I can. Comparing two, two different ways to perform hypothesis tests. Whenever you're performing hypothesis tests, you may be using a Z test or a T test most normally. And those are different buttons on the calculator and different things that you input. You have to get used to those different things. But I want to compare a couple of examples with you where I use Z-test and the T-test. I've also noticed this, that several of you on the homework are getting very good at using the test screen on your calculator which I encourage. So just to make sure everybody, I might pull up my on-screen calculator later, but under stats, there's this test screen where the calculator can perform just about all these tests that we're doing for you. Every test we've done so far. Now the only downside is you got to input the information exactly like the calculator wants it. And sometimes the calculator uses different notation than you use. Okay, so I have no problem if you're using this test screen and I'll try to demonstrate it today to perform Z test or T test, to perform two sample Z test or two sample T tests, and to perform one population proportion Z test or two population proportion Z test. Those are some of the tests that we've done so far. Of course, these are the names the calculator gives to these. You also calculated confidence intervals and the calculator calls them Z intervals and T intervals. And then there's more tests down the screen that we'll talk about. So, Oops, went too far. I have no problem if you're using these screens to perform tests on the problems you're given. I really, and some people did that and, and brought screenshots to me in the last homework. I think that's good. I gotta give you one warning though, is make sure that you can calculate these results, these tests directly yourself too. And the reason why is because if you can't calculate it directly yourself and you're just taking the word of the calculator screen, that's gonna be very good when you press the buttons the right way. But you and I have the same problem. Sometimes we press the wrong button. Sometimes we input the information differently or not well. So my suggestion, and that's how I'll try to demonstrate it today, is to use these tests, these built-in tests as backup to check your work. And then you're giving yourself a lot of confidence on a test in person or a test like we're doing right now, take home. You know, I often say this to students in the classroom when they're taking a test, you know, what would it be worth to you to know that the answer is right before you leave the room? What would it be worth to you to know that your answer is right before you hand in that test? So the calculator has a lot of built-in features like this, both in statistics and other classes. So I just wanna say, make sure you use these to back yourself up and don't use them as your only shot at a problem. If you can understand what I'm trying to say there, we'll demonstrate. So I've got four examples picked out, two of each of these, and we'll see what we can squeeze in. I also want to remind you, it's coming right up on you, that exam two is next week. And we're gonna run exam two pretty much exactly like we ran exam one. There's a set of particular instructions I want you to follow and sign off on. Uh, the exam's going to be, you know, last exam was six questions. In my mind, I think exam two is also six questions, but I haven't finished writing them. So I'm not gonna commit 
it's got to be exactly six, but you know, that would be a, probably a reasonable expectation. Problems similar to homework problems, problems similar to the problems we've done in the book. So remember the procedure for the exam week. Tuesday, you're gonna hand in homework number nine by the normal time, 11.59 p.m. due date. And then the same night by 11.59 p.m. Exam two will be released on our website as it was in the previous exam. I misspelled released, <laughs> sorry. on our week 12 page. And then you have one week to do that, seven days. And then the following Tuesday, I should put dates on these, right? So uh, that would be Tuesday, March 30. You hand in homework nine and I post exam two. And then the following Tuesday, which I believe is April 6th. I just turn around here, look at my calendar on the wall. That is correct, April 6th. Exam two is due by the usual 11.59. Remember why you're working on the exam in that week. There'll be no homework do in that week. I'm not gonna give you two homework problems and six exam problems. They're all just, the exam is like an extended homework. So the exam is gonna be the only thing you're concentrating on next week. Monday and Wednesday class sessions, our recorded class sessions here, our review sessions where you can come and ask any problem you like. Uh, if you ask, how do I do the problem on the test? I'll just say, well, I can't tell you that. But you can find problems in the book that are similar. You can find homework problems that you wanna double check your work on, right? So Monday and Wednesday, and this would be 329 and 331 are just class sessions only reviewing your questions. I don't think I have anything prepared I want to say to you. I want to give you guys the maximum chance to answer, ask your questions. Okay, so that's the program. And let's get into some examples. So I want to do a couple examples of each of these. Let's call this A and B. And depending on what we get to today, you can look at these examples if we don't cover everything. In the first case, I'm gonna look in the book at their try it problem. The try it problems in the book always follow the examples they give you an example, they work it out, and then they say, here's another one for you to try. So try it, 10.8 is interesting. And exercise 10.1, number 112 is interesting. In, this is, sorry, uh, that's 10.3, that's section 10.3, because that's what we're talking about today. And let me just make sure I quoted that right. Yes, that's section 10.3, number 112. In section 10.4, these topics are from sections 10.3 and 10.4. I want you to look at example 10.11.
an example, 1013. I also picked these examples because they demonstrate this important term, two-tailed tests versus one-tailed tests. So each one of these illustrates one of these terms. Okay, let's get to it. Let's compare two independent population proportions. This is a case where you're wondering, are there as many of these as there are of those? 60% uh, of high school students are involved in high school sports. Does that make a difference whether you say male or female? Maybe 64% of female high school students are involved in high school sports and 62% of male high school students are involved in high school sports. You'd like to know if there's a difference between the male and female. Or drivers above the age of 60 and drivers below the age of 60. Maybe you'd like to compare their insurance rates, their accident rates. Maybe you'd like to compare how many cars they own. So anytime you're comparing two populations, two independent populations. That means not the same groups, two distinct groups. You can compare the proportion of them that have some quality. And this is called a proportion test. It's a Z test of population proportions. Now there are some conditions that you have to satisfy in order to perform these tests. Your samples need to be simple random samples, legitimate samples, not convenient samples. You have to have a population that's of a size that you have plenty of examples of each case. Now, let me move my paper up, excuse me. So since we're talking about proportion, you know, we call success the people that have the quality we're searching for or the objects that have the quality we're searching for. What proportion of cars on the street are red? Then seeing a red car is called success and seeing a car that's not red is called failure. So we need when we check proportions, the number of successes and failures in each group. To be non-trivial, you, you could never create a useful test for a red car or the number of red cars you see on the street if no car was ever red or if so few cars were ever red that you would never observe them, right? So the number of successes and failures, the number of observations you have for and against some property should be non-trivial. And people usually set this standard as at least five. So you need a relatively large sample and at least five successes or failures in each group. Third condition, the sample sizes 
should not be too much of any particular population. Should be no more than 5% of the given populations. And this tells you that your sample is independent, that these things are independent, that you're talking about two substantial populations. So we can check out these conditions as we go. Once you meet these conditions, then you can talk about the distribution of the difference of proportions. And under these two conditions, you have two different population proportions you're studying. This distribution will be a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a funny standard deviation. PC, one minus PC, one over NA and one over NB. And let me explain this. You have two proportions that you're measuring and we'll write this out in a table shortly. Let me number my pages as we go along. And you're examining the difference of the proportions, but you need some way to compare that to a set proportion, a set distribution. So PC right here is called the pooled proportion. It is an type of averaging of the two individual proportions you're observing. The NA and the NB are the sample sizes from the populations A and B. And the formula for the pooled population is the number of people that have the property, number of people or objects that have the property in the two populations A and B, divided by the number of people sampled or the number of objects sampled in populations A and B. So it's kind of like the total proportion of people that said yes, or the total proportion of people or objects that had, <coughs> excuse me, that had that property. And under these conditions, you can define this test statistic that I'm about to write down. And that allows you to perform a hypothesis test with a Z test. The example is gonna make this more clear. With the example, we'll be able to fill in all these blanks. And the test statistic is the difference in the sample proportions from the two populations minus the difference in the true population proportions. So in a hypothesis test, you're either gonna say this is zero or this is some known thing, divided by that standard deviation with the pooled proportions. PC, one minus PC. Remember PC, population pooled proportion, the population that has the quantity 
one minus PC is the population or the fraction of the population that doesn't have the quantity. So this is success and failure. Sometimes people write this as P and Q. Okay, this is the setup. This is the total setup for comparing two independent population proportions, but we need to execute it in a problem. So let me read this problem with you. Try it 10.8. So I'm gonna bring it up on the screen and then I'm gonna share it because I don't wanna just write it down on my paper. I want to execute it. There's example 10.8. Let me show you what the book looks like. Example 1.8, we went through this example last time. So in a way I'm repeating this technique. And then here's a problem, try it 10.8. So two types of valves are being tested to determine if there's a difference in the pressure tolerances. Are these two valves equally effective, or maybe one is tougher than the other. 15 out of a random sample of 100 of valve A cracked under this pressure, 450 pound, uh, 4,500 4, pounds per square inch. Six out of 100 cracked at that pressure. Can you tell whether these two valves are really different? Or did you just get Unluck, unlucky on valve A. Test at the 5% level of significance. Okay, I'm gonna move this stuff off the top of my page and keep it around for a second. But I'm gonna write down the details of this problem on the paper as they've expressed it very briefly. Okay, you can have your book open to that page or whatever you like. So this is the example called, try it 10.8, section 10.3. So what we have here, you always wanna make a table in this case, let's call it valve A and valve B, that's what they call it. And they've tested a number of these objects. Valve A, they tested 100. Valve B, they tested 100. Doesn't have to be the same number, but that's what they chose to do. Uh, we're looking for the proportion that failed. And the number of valves that failed. Valve A was 15 and valve B was six. And that gives you two different proportions, two different sample proportions. Since we're dealing with relatively round numbers, 106 here, the proportion of valve A that failed in your sample is 15% the proportion that valve B failed was 6%. Now let's address a couple of things before we go on. First of all, you say, wow, 6%, 15%. I'm not buying either one of those valves. Uh, they tested it at 4,500 PSI. Now, not being an engineer, I don't know if that's a lot or a little, but I think what they're doing is testing this well beyond the stated limits of the valve, probably. This is an extreme test. So 15% failure rate under extreme conditions may not be unusual. Second thing you say is, well, I don't care whether it's unusual or not, I'm not buying valve A. Because it does seem to be a lot more failures in valve A at that extreme temperature uh, pressure. But we're faced with this problem. Is it really different valve A or valve B? Or you just got some bad luck on valve A yesterday when you tested these, right? So that's what you want to know. 
is the difference between these two things just random chance? Or does it indicate a real difference between these two values? We're setting the level of significance at 0 0.05. So our definition of random chance here is, does this happen less than 5% of the time? Such a bad example. Would such an extreme example happen only in one out of 20 testings? Well, this is what we're going to say. Let's write our hypothesis. They wanted to know, pay attention to their words, if there was any difference in the pressure tolerances. So our null hypothesis is going to be there is no difference between these tolerances. That valve A is as good as valve B. But we suspect from these numbers that there is a difference. We suspect valve B is better. We suspect that the proportion of valve A that fails is not the same as the proportion of valve B that fails. So they said they wanted to know if there was a difference. Notice they did not say they wanted to know one was better or worse. But is there a good reason to believe that these valves are different under those conditions? Now remember, this is the null hypothesis. And this is the alternative hypothesis. Okay, let's fill in the blanks here. We need the pooled proportion, which remember was the number of successes in the two samples divided by the number of opportunities in the two samples. It's 15 plus 16, sorry, 15 plus six over 100 plus 100, that is 21 out of 200. That's a decimal. That's just a little bit over 10%. You can check that on your calculator, 10 and a half percent. It's not a hard number to work with. Sorry, I'm gonna move my paper up. What else do we need to check? We need to check the Z statistic. Here's our test statistic. We have the two population proportions in our samples. We're going to subtract those. And then we're going to subtract what we are testing PA minus PB, but our null hypothesis says this is zero. So that's going to be zero when we insert that. And the denominator is going to be PC, one minus PC, and then this combination of the two sample sizes. Now this is the part that gets awkward sometimes to type into your calculator, especially with the examples from the previous day about degrees of freedom. But that's where those screen tests are going to help you. The screen tests can verify that you did this correctly. So in this problem, what we have is 0.15 to minus 0.06. And PC was 0 0.1050, one minus that is 0 0.8950. And then these fractions that are awkward to enter, one one hundredth plus one one hundredth. So I'm gonna enter that on my calculator and get a number. 
And then later we'll test that against the Z test screen under the test menu. So give me a moment, because this time I will pull up the calculator on screen instead of holding my calculator under the camera. And the only issue here is my screen, screen does after a while tend to get very crowded. So let me share the screen with you. After I clear things out, got it. Good, go. Let's share the calculator screen. And let's enter this number that I wrote on the paper. Sorry, parentheses, 0 0.15 minus 0 0.06. Make sure you use lots of parentheses. Divided by square root. Parentheses, 0 0.1050 times 0 0.8950. That's 1 minus 1050. And then now this awkward 1 divided by 100 plus 1 divided by 100. Those are two fractions written horizontally in the calculator. Now remember, the calculator is going to help me check this later. That number is 2.0759. If I round up, 2.0760. Now remember, that is what we call the Z value. That's what we're going to test. And remember, I want you to think of, I'm going to go back to my drawing screen now. I want you to think of that number on a standard normal distribution. Now I'm going to have the calculator draw this later, but let me do a, try to do a decent job of drawing this here. It's not bad, but you don't have to be a, an artist, you just have to make something fair. This is a standard Z distribution, normal distribution. Mean zero, standard deviation one. And that 2.0760 is over here, just past two. The shade past two. And it indicates an area under this curve. But I'm not just interested in the area above this. Since this is a two-tailed test, I could be different. These two valves could be different. Valve B could be worse than valve A, or valve A could be worse than valve B. Since this is a two-tailed test, and two-tailed test refers to equal or not equal. There's two ways for things to be not equal. This could be larger than this, or PA could be larger than PB. So I have to take that area on both tails of the standard distribution. Minus two standard deviations from the center, from the mean, which is zero. And that is just slightly below a negative 20760, slightly below that. And so this is the area that I have to add up and compare to my preset level of significance. The sum of these two areas is my p-value, my probability value, and I'm going to compare the p-value to the alpha and see which one's bigger. So let's find out the areas under these two pieces. I can do that again on the calculator manually or on the calculator automatically. 
let's first of all do it manually. Let's set up a normal distribution. If you're not sure how I set that up, I'll show you. I have the Y equals menu. I go to the distribution menu, normal distribution, value X, because I'm gonna put it in the Y equals graph menu, mu zero, standard deviation one, paste. That's how I get this in the Y equals menu. And my window, Looks good for size. We'll check it out in a second. And graph. There's my normal distribution. It looks a little bit like the one I drew. And I want to know how much area is above 2.0760. Now I could do that here on this graph, or I can do it with command on the computer but I'm gonna manually draw this on the graph right here. In the calculate menu and number seven is the area. And my lower limit is 2.0760. It's right there, just a shade above two as you see. And then I can move this to the right hand side of the screen. And it tells me that area is 0189. So this area, 0 0.0189, but this area is symmetrically the same. So the p-value is the sum of these two areas. Let's add these two areas together. I go back to my I got to be careful because I wanted to be sharing the calculator screen. I thought I was sharing the calculator screen. There's the standard normal deviation with the area above 2.0760. There's the area, 0 0.0189. Okay, now I'm going to go back to my paper and add 0 0.0189 on both sides. So my p-value is 0. 0, 3, 7, 8. And what is that compared to my alpha, which is 0 0.05? That is less than alpha. What does it mean when the p value is less than the alpha? That means this is too rare to be acceptable. This kind of difference happens fewer than one out of 20 times. So if I'm observing this difference, this is too much to be up to random chance. I cannot support this idea that these valves be, perform the same. I have to reject the H naught, I have to reject the null hypothesis. And I have to write down that there is significant evidence. There is real evidence that these two valves do not perform the same. I got to read it the way the word said in the book. There is significant evidence that there is a difference in the pressure tolerances of these two valves. Always end your test with a sentence explaining the result. There is a significant evidence, there is significant evidence that there is a difference in the pressure tolerances. of these two valves. And it's good to say this too. I should say, at what level? At the alpha equals 0 0.05, or at the 5% level of significance.
Okay. Oh, I'm going back to my paper. Two-tailed test. I found the area here. I found the area here. I added them up. Both of those areas together are less than my level of significance. So I do not believe it's the null hypothesis. I think there's a strong evidence that these two valves have different pressure tolerances. I didn't prove anything. That's just, I don't believe the null hypothesis anymore. Let me show you how to get this 0189 elsewhere on your calculator. Remember, you can do this on the calculator by testing how much area is above that curve, not in a picture, but in a distribution. So you could go to the normal cumulative distribution function for a standard deviation. And you could say you're going to run that from 2.0760 up to infinity 1 times 10 to the 99th standard distribution mean 0 standard deviation 1. That also gave you the 0 0.189 probability. You could also draw this distribution, normal distribution function. I could have entered it here on the screen, 2.0760, 1 times e to the 99th. And that filled in the commands for me, same number. So let's try this test button that I advertised at the beginning of class. This is a two proportion Z test. I've got two independent proportions. I'm performing a Z test. And look at the screen right here. The screen's going to fill in all this information for me. Well, I have to put the right numbers in the right thing. So I'm going to call valve A the one and valve B the two. So let's say I had 15 failures in 100 valve A's. I had six failures in 100 valve B's. And what am I testing? Whether the two proportions are different, whether the first is less than the second or the second is less than the first. I'm testing that the two proportions are different. Now, I've got two choices down here, calculate and draw. First, let's do calculate and see all the work we did summarized by the calculator on this one screen. It says the z-score is 207.60, rounded off. It says that the probability of this happening is 0378965. That was the sum of the two tails. It says the first proportion is 15%. The second proportion is 6%. It says the pooled proportion is 0 0.1050. It's verifying all the calculations we did to set up this problem. So this is what I said to you about, you could use the screen as a test or as a check that you did the right work. But let's do it again and tell the calculator to draw it for us. Stats, tests, number six, two proportion Z test. All the same data, but now let's draw it. Now remember, we had already drawn the blue curve. But here, it draws the same curve over again, and it shades the two tails. And it tells you that when it shaded the two tails, the sum of the area was 0 0.0379. And the z-score where they did this was 2.076. So again, this is a good screen for the summary of my drawing. <coughs> OK, that was part of my goal today. I wanted to make sure. And I got to make sure that I was executing the calculator there.
Okay, I am gonna just run through this one more time just to be perfect, just to make sure I did this right. Tests, two proportion Z tests. These instructions are in the book. I entered the data, 15 out of 100, six out of 100, different proportions, calculate. And here's all the data we calculated by hand on the paper. And then if I repeat that, sorry, stats, tests, number six, but this time I'm gonna have the calculator draw it. That was the curve I drew, the blue one. Now the curve, the calculator draws is in magenta. There's a summary of our result. Okay, so this is a big part of what I wanted to do today, show you how to calculate this by hand and calculate it with the tools built into the calculator. Okay, let's go back. Okay, pages, pages. So we just did that problem, two-tailed test in section 10.3. I have three other examples I want to do. We're not going to get to do every one of them, but let's do this example just to show you a one-tailed test of a problem in 10.4. Let me move my papers out of the way. Got it. Let me look up in the book this example in 10.4. Example 1011, I'm gonna share my book with you again and find the problem in the book so we don't just rewrite everything. These are called matched or paired samples. This is a different kind of test. Here we go. number 1011. Let's read it together and then I'll show you how to perform the test. Okay, a study was conducted to investigate the effectiveness of hypnotism and reducing pain. Okay, and I, I don't know much about medicine and I don't know much about hypnotism, but you know, you, they make all kinds of claims about hypnotism, help you stop smoking, help you reduce weight, help you reduce pain. And you can't deny that people, what they believe has a significant effect on what happens to them. So here's somebody performing a test. The study was conducted to investigate the difference, the effectiveness of hypnotism and reducing pain. And these, results are shown from randomly selected subjects before and after being hypnotized. And the numbers they attach must be levels of pain. The problem says a lower score indicates less pain. So how do I test to see if the hypnotism did reduce the pain from this sample? I mean, I can look at each value. Oh, uh, sure, the pain went down from 6.5 to 2.4. That's good, hypnosis reduces pain. But wait a minute, this person's pain went up. That's not what I want. A lot of these values go down. One of these values goes up. Some of them go down dramatically. Some of them go down just barely. I might have a belief that hypnosis reduces pain, but can I test whether this dropping in these eight people was random chance or an indication that something significant happened. Okay, so this is called from section 10.4. I'm gonna go back to my paper now and I'll come back and collect these numbers in a second. Matched 
or paired samples. When you test the same object or person twice, I'm gonna put this medicine on the left cheek, a, a burn medicine. Somebody had a burn on the face and I'm testing two different medicines. On the left side of the face, I will put medicine A, the right side of the face, I'll put medicine B and I'll test them to see if they're different. Or before and after, here's the pain level experience before hypnosis, here's the pain level experience after hypnosis in the same person. Anytime you're testing the same person or the same object twice, Let's talk about the output of this valve without lubrication and the output of this valve with lubrication B or lubrication A. Just to go back to that valve meme. Anytime you're testing the same object twice with and without treatment. You could do this to twins it's frequently done to twins. They do lots of studies. When a twin pair of babies is born to someone in the medicine and psychology and things like this, they love to perform tests to see if the two twins react the same way. And the reason why is because those two twins ought to be very, very similar biologically. Do they have the same X? Do they have the same Y? Do they have the same any property? That's an example of a matched or paired sample. Sometimes you could say married couples is an example of a matched or paired sample because they are together as one unit in many ways. Maybe their financial records, maybe even their diet. You know, a married couple probably eats essentially the same diet as they're eating and living together. Okay, how do you test a matched or paired sample? This is a t-test. Because I don't know everything about the whole population. I don't know that I have a standard normal distribution. The reason why this is a t-test our sample sizes in such tests are often small. You can't assemble 10,000 pairs of twins to do a study. Not that there aren't 10,000 twins on the planet. I'm sure there are many, many, maybe more but you can't collect a lot of twins easily for a study. When you have a matched or paired sample, you collect two data samples. From each pair of individuals and objects, or individuals or objects. And two samples could be a before and after, as this problem is showing us. What you do to perform the test is you calculate the difference the average or mean difference in the two samples, pain level before, pain level after, weight before diet A, weight after diet A, cholesterol level, anything that you're doing right there. 
and you perform your hypothesis test on the difference of the sample means. Okay, let's see how this works in practice. You have a sample size N. This is a t-test, so the degrees of freedom is N minus one. You have a sample mean of differences, and I'll show you this to you in a problem in a second, that you collected from your sample. The D stands for differences. And then you have an expectation of the general population mean of differences. Sorry, I got to advance my paper and number it properly, excuse me. So the T test, the T statistic, the test statistic here, You also have the sample standard deviation. The standard deviation of the sample means. Sorry, I got to move up my paper. S sub D will be the standard deviation of the sample means. The test statistic is T value the sample mean of differences minus what you expect the population mean of differences to be divided by the standard deviation of this distribution of differences divided by the square root of n. It's the typical format of a t-test. Now let's take a look at example 1011. So I'm going to write down the numbers on the paper that are in the example in that problem. And then we'll write our hypothesis. So this is pain reduction from hypnosis. And we tested eight people before and after. I don't know if you've ever experienced this in a doctor's office or in a medical office. The doctor, or the nurse, the person who's helping you out says, what's the level of the pain on a scale of one to 10? Maybe you've heard that question before. So they did this before and after, and the numbers were 6.6 .6 and 6.8. I'll write these down just so I can keep them on my paper, even though they're written in the book. 9.0 and 7.4, and 8.5, 11 and 8.1, 8.1, and 6.1. It's not on a scale of one to 10, apparently, because I've got a couple numbers above 10 but some scale that was constructed by the medical professionals. 
the eighth person, 11.6 and 2.0. That person really felt better. But I'm interested not in the before or after, who had more pain or less pain. I'm interested in the differences. So what are the differences? Actually, this person was plus 0 0.2. But other than that, I had some reductions here, like right, minus 4.1. I'm trying to squeeze things into space, so I wrote the plus or minus above. I'm writing the pluses in black and the minuses in red. Minus 1.6, minus 1.8, minus 3.1, minus 2.0, minus 2.7, uh, sorry, 2.9. And what's this one? Big jump, minus 9.6. These are the things I'm going to study. These are the differences. And I want to know the mean value, the average value of the differences. And I want to know the standard deviation of the differences. Now I could do these by hand as we've regularly done them by hand, but I can also input these numbers in the calculator and let the calculator tell me the differences. In fact, your book says you can input these numbers and get the differences in a different way. Why don't I input the pain levels before in one list, the pain levels after in another list, and then make a third list to subtract after minus before. Seven out of the eight people had a reduction in pain. Certainly, hypnosis must reduce the pain. But can I really say that? Maybe it was just random chance. I want to know how likely this was that this could be random chance. Did they specify a level of significance in the problem? They said, test at 5% level of significance. I also wanted to point this out. Sometimes the problems in the book don't give you the level of significance. And then 5% is a standard choice. So if the problem doesn't specify, you choose 5%. But sometimes people choose to test at a different percentage medical cases, things like that. Sometimes people choose to test at a higher level of significance, maybe if the problem is not so critical. Okay, I'm gonna to switch to the calculator, input these numbers, and then show you how to get the mean and standard deviation from the calculator, which we've done from the first part of this class. But I wanna show you how to get these differences in the calculator. Okay, so get rid of that screen, get rid of that screen, Get rid of that screen. Let us go to statistics, edit. And this must have been a list from some other day. Let me input the eight pain levels in list one before. 6.6, 6.5, 9.0, 10 10.3, 11.3, 8.1, 6.3, and 11.6. I got those all in there correctly. Yes, now let's do the pain levels after. 6.8, 2.4, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, 8.1, 6 6.1, 3.4, and 2.0. Now in this, I wanna to test to see 
if the pain levels went down, right? So here's my hypotheses. Let me switch back to the paper for a second. Somehow going back and forth between my calculator and my paper. I'm not always sure I'm showing you the calculator. So if I'm not showing the calculator, but I'm telling you about the calculator, just give me a shout. Let's call this the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And from the problem, what do we want to know? Are the measurements of pain lower after hypnosis? So I want to know if in general, for the whole population, the difference is negative. Negative mean would mean on the average for everyone, there's less pain after hypnosis. What would it be if the hypnosis didn't make any difference? Well, that would be the mean difference is greater than or equal to zero. In some cases, you could have more pain after hypnosis. I'm not sure why medically, but maybe it's just what people perceive. So this is my null hypothesis, that the hypnosis didn't have any effect. And here's my alternative hypothesis. On average, the pain levels went down. That means on average, there's a negative difference. The difference is less than zero. Let's go back to the calculator. And I'm trying to make sure I absolutely grab the calculator. There we go. So got the calculator in front of us. And we have the two lists before and after. Now let's go and create the third list here, which is going to be list two minus list one. I just say list two minus list one. And you see it filled in all those numbers for me, all of them negative except for the first. Now with the statistics feature, I can calculate the one variable statistics on not list one, be careful, I want to be in list three, second function, list three, no frequency, list, calculate, and I'll write this on my paper and then I'll go back to my paper. The mean was 3.1250. The standard deviation was of the sample of the population 2.9114. Okay, now I'm ready to perform my hypothesis test. Let me go back to paper. Now I have all I need to do to fill in this test statistic. And then I'll perform the t-test. OK, next sheet of paper. I'll keep these numbers handy for a second. We're doing fair on time. Sometimes it's hard to work through all these things. I want to do four problems. I actually did two problems. It's not terrible because these are two problems that are very representative of your homework. So the t-test is going to be the difference, the mean, the difference, the mean difference minus what I believe is the population difference divided by Standard deviation of the differences divided by square root of n. Remember in this problem, n was eight. So when I do that, minus 3.1250 
subtract. Now, I'm expecting that, or I'm going to take the point of view that hypnosis has no effect. I'm going to be kind of a critic of hypnosis or a non-believer. Let's say that the average value of the differences after hypnosis is zero. Hypnosis had no effect. So you usually take that term to be zero. And then the standard deviation 2.9114 divided by the square root of eight. I'm gonna just do this in my calculator before I go back to the screen calculator. Just tell you what this number is because it's kind of a short number. Uh, I can have it under the camera for you. Minus 3.1250 divided by. Now I gotta be careful to use parentheses here because this whole number, there's a division inside that number, right? So I gotta use parentheses. 2.9114 divided by square root of eight. And that means I gotta be careful with my closing parentheses. So that's the whole denominator right there. Calculator says 3.0359. Okay, good. Just keeping my papers together. Got it. Now I'm gonna do the t-test. Now remember the t-test is on a t-distribution. Looks very much like standard distribution, except it's a little thinner in the middle, a little wider at the tails. This is a terrible drawing of a t-distribution. I'm gonna have the calculator draw it for me in a second. But let's just say this is my sample drawing. And it's also centered at zero. And going through some standard deviations here, minus 3059 is way over here. 30359. So this area is not large. Well, it's not large in my really bad drawing. So this is a T distribution. Remember, we do T distribution based on degrees of freedom. So I need to say seven degrees of freedom. So I want to know what this area is, but I think I better let the calculator draw this for me. So I can say T cumulative distribution function in the calculator. This is gonna be my P value my probability value, the likeliness of this event. And I'll do that on my screen calculator. So it's a little bit bigger and easier to read. So screen calculator, clear, quit, clear these buttons. Maybe you can see more buttons when we do this. So let's say distribution. What is the cumulative t distribution, t cumulative distribution function from minus infinity to minus 30359. Minus 3.0359. Degrees of freedom was seven. And now we paste. Calculator says this is zero zero, nine, five, if you round off to four digits. I'm just gonna write what I wrote on the paper and the calculator screen. When I come back to my paper, we'll see that written down for everyone. So this p-value is 0 0.0095. That's the area in this tail. I will have the calculator give me a better drawing in a second. So let's go back to paper. I want to know, is the p-value compared to my alpha? p-value 0 0.0095 is definitely smaller than my alpha. 
And what does that mean? This is rare. What does it mean in my problem? I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. Remember, my null hypothesis was that hypnosis made no difference. So when the p-value is less than alpha, you reject the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis was hypnosis made no difference. So what am I going to say? I have found evidence. I have found significant evidence. Remember, significant means at the 5% level. Always mention the level you use in your answer. I, there is significant evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level that the average or that hypnosis reduced pain levels Hypnosis reduces pain levels in treated subjects. I'm saying that a little bit too stilted, a little bit too complicated. This was before versus after. What does that mean? Yeah, p-value low, very low p-value, less than 1%. That means that these numbers that I observed, yeah, they could have happened by random chance. I could have just got lucky. But here, the value of getting lucky was less than one in 100. You know, if someone wants to play a game with you and says, yeah, you could get lucky and win $10 but you only have a one in a hundred chance. You don't consider that to be very likely that you're gonna win $10. And that's what I have here. Are these numbers just lucky or do they really say the hypnosis reduces pain? According to my calculations at the 5% level, that's my bar, these numbers were very unlikely, less than one in a hundred times. That's less than one in 20 times. So I do not think this was by random chance. I think that there is strong evidence that hypnosis reduces pain. Uh, I gotta wrap it up here, but let me just say to be careful when you make these statements. All I said is that there's significant evidence. I did not say that I proved hypnosis reduces pain. I don't even know if it's possible to prove anything like that, right? Because People are different everywhere, right? What works for one person doesn't work for the other. But if you're in the doctor's office and the doctor says to you, yeah, you got that back pain, uh, that back pain, David. I know that's tough, that's pretty bad. I've got this hypnosis treatment. And according to all of our tests, there is significant evidence that the hypnosis treatment will reduce your pain. Well, if they've done that test properly, then yeah, I'm going to let the doctor prescribe that to me because he doesn't think that that's random chance. Let me show you what this looks like in the calculator, the drawing, before we hang it up today. So I can go to this test window again. And what we're doing right here is we're testing, excuse me, a two sample T test. Let's try a two sample T test. And I'm going to input this data right here for the
Um, I don't want to do a two sample t-test. Please excuse me. Let me go backwards. I've already got the sample data and the differences. I just need to do a one sample t-test. Okay. Let's try a one sample t-test where the ordinary mean of differences should be zero. The mean of differences was minus 3.125. You see, I already typed this example in. The standard deviation was 2.914. The number of people studied was eight. And I'm testing to see if the pain difference is less than zero. Let's do the calculation. And there's my answer. The p-value is 0095. The mean was negative 3125. The test statistic that we calculated by hand was negative 30359. And if I want to see this drawn, let's go back to this calculate t-test. Let's have it draw it this time. Ah, sorry. Press the wrong button. T-test. Let's go down here and draw this T-test. My T distribution drawing was terrible. Remember, T distribution looks like a standard normal distribution, slightly different. But it says, look at this. This area under here was 0095. It's very unlikely that this happened by random chance for the T value of negative 30359. Here's one, two, three, just less than three. You see that little shaded, very thin shaded region. That was much better than my drawing over here. Okay, these are two good examples. I want you to be able to use the calculator to do the calculations one step at a time. I want you to be able to use the calculator to check. So make sure you practice both. Think of the calculator as your backup, not your entire solution, right? If you're a pilot, you got the ejection seat as a backup in case the plane fails. That's not your go-to method of operating the plane, right? You pull out the ejection sheet ejection seat if you have massive failure of the plane you just want to clear yourself i don't think this is a good analogy is it okay use the calculator test to verify your calculations don't just trust the calculations you type in the calculator because you might enter data incorrectly okay get ready next week for our exam you can study the sections we've covered from chapter six through 10, just the sections we've covered, make a list of your questions, go back over old homework problems, check out the two homework problems for this week, and then next week we'll just be studying and preparing for the test. You guys have a nice weekend there. I'm gonna go to another appointment. I'm sorry to keep you so close to two o'clock. <laughs>